I said today, uh, I'll of course be getting into uh, to discussing mostly the later part of the Roman Empire. I'll cover from the second century, at least up to the fifth century, when I guess they have the decline or the collapse of the, the Roman Empire uh, that we have. Uh, so we'll kind of get up to that and maybe talk about some of the barbarians that come in, because uh, that's that's where they think the Middle Ages kind of gets going at that point uh, overall. Uh, if you have any comments, questions during the lecture live stream, uh, you know, let me know, or you can always send me some comments, questions later uh, if you want uh, through my YouTube channel. If you got a, uh, you know, uh, question about the class, just email me. Of course, you got that email pretty much uh, overall. So uh, anyway, uh, from last time, um, I believe we had, of course, we had, of course, started talking about, you know, the Roman Empire. Uh, I had, you know, covered up. I think we had covered pretty much through uh, the period of the Julio-Claudian dynasty from the age of Augustus. Uh, we went up through there, talked about all those emperors. Rise of Christianity, uh, the Flavian dynasty, like Vespasian and his sons. Uh, I also talked about the beginning, at least. Uh, the period of the five good emperors. Uh, I think we went through at least two of them, I know, uh, which were uh, Nerva. I think I talked about him, and I think I talked about also Trajan. So that's about where we were uh, from last time. Uh, I know we talked about the first two you see on the left there. Uh, we have not talked about, of course, uh, the other ones you see, of course, to the left to the right there. Hadrian, of course, Antoninus Pius, and also Marcus Relic. So we're going to get to you know those three uh, and talk about them, of course, today. Um, so yeah, we have Hadrian, uh, who that's his full name, Publius Alias Hadrianus, but of course everybody called him Hadrian. Uh, Hadrian's background, a little bit about him. Uh, Hadrian was uh, kind of like um, Emperor Trajan. He was of Spanish origin. Uh, he um, was mostly a Roman general. In fact, I think he was a cousin of actually of, of basically of Trajan. And uh, he was chosen, you know, I think I mentioned this before, he had been chosen pretty much as the successor to, you know, um, uh, Trajan, uh, like we had talked about the adoptive emperors of the five good emperors. And uh, Hadrian reigned from 117 to 138. Those are the years of his reign. So power a pretty long time. Uh, and... Um, Anyway, very militaristic, kind of like uh, Trajan was, but he kind of abandoned a lot of Trajan's policies. Like Trajan was big into expansion, ex expanding the empire, which mostly eastward. He kind of went away from that, and Hadrian went more into uh, creating more defensive uh, fortifications, like borders and so on, to protect the empire rather than expanding it you know, more and more and more. Uh, and so that's something that Hadrian really helped influence a lot, uh, which I'll talk about Hadrian's Wall a little later. Of course, he was known for. Uh, Hadrian had a nickname. He was often called the Greekling. Well, he was called this because uh, he was heavily influenced by Greek culture. He loved Greek culture. He loved Greek architecture. Uh, he was amateur architect himself, uh, believe it or not. Uh, in fact, he designed buildings and stuff like that. Like they think Hadrian's Wall may have been designed by him, possibly. Uh, but they definitely uh, designed the Pantheon Temple in Rome uh, that he's well known for. Uh, and uh, I think he was somewhat e educated as well in a lot of the Hellenistic culture. So he was kind of into that, uh, which some emperors were into. Also, starting with him, you'll, you'll notice a lot of the emperors, like their statues, they have beards. Uh, beards become kind of a fad uh, at that time. Uh, and so a lot of emperors, you know, up through Marcus Aurelius, et cetera, uh, are often seen with beards. Kind of like today, a lot of men like wear beards and all that, but I've never been a beard guy much. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, the thing that uh, Hadrian's really known for, of course, is Hadrian's Wall, which I showed that little short video on, uh, which was built in uh, Rome and Britain, which the Romans called Britannia, which Britannia, you know, was the most northern border of the Roman Empire, uh, which you can see there on the right, showing kind of like Britain, mostly England right there on the bottom. And um, uh, Hadrian's Wall was this 80-mile fortification that was built by the Roman army itself. Like Roman soldiers actually constructed it. It's built in the 120s. It was supposed to protect basically Rome's northern border 
against various Scottish barbarians that were in the north, like the Picts and other types of peoples, Caledonian peoples that were into the north. Uh, and um, it's not actually on the border between Scotland and England, like some people believe, but like right below it, close to where, yeah, Newcastle, we're talking about, I guess, Newcastle upon Tyne, is, but that city is kind of nearby. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, so it was constructed most, like I said, by the Roman army. Uh, and actually, he actually went there. Like Hadrian actually went up there and visited his, you know, his troops. And I guess he thought they didn't have too much to do up there. So <laughs> made him get busy, you know, building this fortification uh, right there. Uh, yeah, it's about 73 miles uh, in length, but a Roman mile is, is a little bit, I think, longer, uh, of course. Um, also, the other thing that he did, too, that's uh, well known. Uh, here, no, here's pictures, by the way, I'll show you, too, by the way, of uh, Hadrian's Wall. Uh, Hadrian's Wall, a lot of it has been dismantled, uh, especially the top half of it. It's been stripped, I think, more into later times was used to build different buildings later in England. Uh, they think the original height of Hadrian's Wall was somewhere between about 15, 20 feet tall. And then I think they say the width was close to about 9 to 10 feet wide uh, in most places. I think you can see here in this picture, it kind of shows you kind of the height now. So maybe the height now is maybe closer to like 6 feet tall, uh, but probably more than half of it has been stripped off, like the top of it. Some sections don't exist anymore. You know, there's some they've helped to preserve, of course, uh, in England today. Uh, they also got these mile castles or mile fortifications uh, where every mile they have a little watchtower, which would you know protect over the wall. And I guess if they got attacked, they would then basically try to stop it. So that's basically Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall, by the way, uh, for you know the longest time was the, the northern border. Uh, of the Roman Empire. Um, they did have another wall called Antonine, which I'll kind of explain a little later about as well. Now, they also had this thing called the uh, Pantheon <clears throat> that was also built uh, as well, uh, which the Pantheon Temple was a temple uh, that was built by Hadrian uh, in around the uh, 120s. And uh, anyway, uh, it was actually a temple <clears throat> that was originally built by the Emperor Augustus, like a long time ago, uh, but it burned down uh, in a fire. Uh, and so Hadrian decided to have it rebuilt, uh, which he was kind of involved in the design of it. Uh, and uh, it's called the Pantheon because of the fact that it was uh, a type of temple that was built to honor all the gods. Uh, so like all the Greco-Roman gods. Over time, it was like it says down there, it was, of course, made into a Catholic church uh, for the longest time. Uh, it is known for its dome, uh, which, you know, it's one of the first major uh, constructed dome type buildings uh, that's built in the Roman world. Uh, the dome is about 142 feet wide, about. And um, you can see it kind of melds together uh, a combination of Greek architect and Roman architect. Like the front of the building is more Greek, like a Greek temple in the back of the building where the main part of the temple is, was more of, more actually more, more like a Roman design. So obviously he kind of incorporated uh, Greco-Roman type, you know, architecture into one building. Uh, it is famous for having what they call an oculus. Like a lot of these buildings in ancient times, like under the Romans and under the Byzantine Empire, have these um, openings in the top, which let light in the day. Right here, it's called an oculus. Also, water will drain through, like rain will drain through. They have some kind of thing on the bottom of the floor that will drain it away. Uh, but a lot of buildings were built like that uh, back in ancient times. So that's artificial light in the day. I guess they have some kind of lights for at nighttime. So that's that's basically some of the stuff that happened under, of course, you know, Emperor Emperor um, uh, Hadrian. Now, let me go ahead and move on. I want to also talk about next, of course, another emperor uh, that's well known at the same time, who was one of the five good emperors as well. That's, of course, Antoninus Pius, uh, who reigned right afterwards. Uh, Antoninus uh, was kind of not as known as uh, some of the other emperors of uh, this time. 
Uh, hey, hey, Nat, by the way, good morning. And hey, also, Markel, I hope you're having a great morning also out there as well. But Antoninus Pius, he reigned next as emperor. Uh, the years for his reign are 138 to 161. Actually, he's the third longest reigning emperor uh, after Augustus and Tiberius, at least up to that time time period. Uh, Antoninus was the emperor that founded the so-called Antonine dynasty of emperors. Uh, which that included four emperors <clears throat> that were in it. Uh, himself, of course, uh, his uh, nephew, which I'll get to in a second, Marcus Aurelius, uh, Lucius Verus, who he adopted uh, as his son, and don't forget Commodus. <clears throat> so it had four emperors uh, that were basically in it. Uh, they think his reign is the peak of the Pax Romana, like the peak of the empire itself, uh, when it's at the most peaceful, because... Uh, by the end of his reign, uh, the empire starts kind of having like wars break out on its borders. And so the, the Roman peace, era of Roman peace, you know, starts to come to an end. Um, so not too many conflicts he was involved in. I think the only thing he did that's very famous, um, Antonius Pius, was he conquered part of Scotland, like the southern part of it. <clears throat> and um, he built this wall that was above it you see there in the map called Antonine Wall. It was built like sometime in the 140s CE or AD. Uh, and it was a wall that was built near the Firth of Forth, which is close to you know, where the Scottish border is. And uh, they were going to have that as the northern border, uh, but they later abandoned it after he died. Uh, and that wall was not built very well. Uh, I believe the Antonine Wall was about 39 miles long uh, in length. So it's like half the length. But, but obviously it's been a lot easier to defend that uh, area. But uh, they retreated back to Hadrian's Wall. Hadrian's Wall pretty much is the northern border of the empire going all the way down to when the empire starts declining and collapsing. Uh, then I'll talk about another emperor that's, of course, well known in this period. Of course, you know, pretty much I think everybody's heard of him. Uh, which is Marcus Aurelius. Uh, you may probably heard of him, Marcus Aurelius. And uh, Marcus Aurelius, of course, uh, is um, considered one of the greatest uh, of the uh, five good emperors uh, that you have. I think he's up there with Trajan and Hadrian uh, overall. And um, he's pretty much the last emperor of the so-called five good emperors and also the last emperor of the Pax Romana because they think the Pax Romana kind of ends in 180. Uh, with his death, and uh, he was believed to be a nephew of Anton Antoninus Pius through his wife, uh, and uh, he and uh, Lucius Verus uh, were adopted basically as his successors pretty much afterwards, so Lucius Verus is like his adopted brother, and uh, so those two actually co-ruled briefly for about eight years, 161 to 169 Lucius Verus wasn't known for too much, but he was actually a pretty good uh, general uh, that was under um, that time period, especially under Marcus Aurelius. And I think Marcus Aurelius was also kind of a Roman general as well. He uh, was kind of a military genius, but he was also seen as this uh, philosopher, like some people call him a philosopher, uh, as kind of a nickname. And um, what happened was uh, the Pax Romana became, began to come to an end. Uh, they had two major wars uh, that broke out on Rome's borders. Uh, they had the Marcomannic Wars, which broke out, or Marcomanni Wars, either one. And um, these were wars where uh, Germanic peoples fought for control of the Danube River region, <clears throat> which the Danube River, by the way, was one of the northern borders of the Roman Empire. It's kind of like Austria-Hungary, as you know where that is, uh, above Italy. And the Parthian Wars were a series of wars where uh, Marcus had, <clears throat> had to fight in uh, what is um, Syrian Mesopotamia. He lost that for a while against them. So you got these wars breaking out. And so that's kind of the end of the Pax Romana at that time. <clears throat> so a lot of historians think of the uh, Roman Empire starts declining about that time. Second, third century uh, is about when it is. They also had a lot of plagues break out at that time, which may have killed Marcus Aurelius, they believe. Like he died of some kind of illness, uh, they think. 
Uh, he was also known for these series of writings he had. So we're kind of like written like a diary when he was at the front lines fighting in some of these wars, especially in, uh, uh, in the Danube River Valley. And uh, he wrote a series of uh, writings that were called the Meditations of Marcus Aurelius, which you may have heard of. And it's based off of Stoicism, which is a type of uh, Greek philosophy that was becoming kind of popular uh, in the Roman world again. And it was based on this philosopher named Zeno, Zeno of Citium. He was from Athens. He lived in the third, third century BC. And for some reason, the Romans kind of started to kind of bring it back. And uh, he was actually taught by various tutors that were uh, scholars that were based in Stoicism. So, so yeah, so he kind of lived his life based on that. Uh, and his writings are kind of famous today, but they weren't meant to be published, apparently. Uh, so it's one of the very few books you can actually read uh, about a Roman his Roman emperor. Uh, there might be like various uh, letters that they may have written and things like that, but there's not too many books that actually, you know, emperors wrote. Uh, Mark Swiss, by the way, died on campaign uh, when he was fighting uh, in Germany, like the Marco Manic Wars we're talking about, and Commodus eventually took over, which is his son, and uh, he had already co-ruled with his father for like, Three, three, four years uh, prior to that, uh, that he took over, and uh, a lot of a lot of historians think that when Commodus came in, that that begins the the end of the Pax Romana. Uh, he's kind of seen as this emperor that is tyrannical, uh, and um, <clears throat> you know, even some of the historians at that time kind of blame him, you know, for maybe why. Or may blame Marcus Aurelius for for you know not adopting a successor and then giving it to his son uh, instead. So that's kind of an issue that they they usually talk about. Uh, anyway, um. So yeah, uh, he, he's he, he's emperor from one eighty to one ninety two, uh, and he had this big cult of personality that was behind him. Uh, he thought he was part god, and he would often dress up <clears throat> like the god Hercules. Uh, that was like his idol uh, and things like that. And uh, he was kind of like uh, kind of like a Caligula. You know, if you say about Caligula before, uh, how he was kind of like sadistic in general. Uh, and um, anyway, um, one thing about Commodus, he was very famous for fighting as a gladiator. He would go into the Colosseum and participate in some of the wild beast hunts. <clears throat> like he was actually a pretty good shot with a bow and arrow. Apparently, uh, and then some of his um, he would fall, also fight in some of the gladiatorial competitions, which I think some of those were fixed, by the way. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think you, I think it was stories where he fought like midgets or something and beat them up. <laughs> really crazy guy. Uh, and uh, the lower classes loved him; they loved Commodus, but uh, the senators thought he was just mad, uh, like the wealthy people and things like that. So. Uh, what happened to him, he was eventually assassinated in 192, uh, December 192. I think December 31st, I think, was the date when he was killed, New Year's Eve. Uh, and um, <clears throat> anyway, it sparked a series of civil war uh, from 192 to 193, really 193, uh, which became known as the Year of the Five Emperors. They actually had five emperors that ruled on uh, 193. And a combination of Roman generals, and I think some of the Roman senators tried to fight over the throne is what happened. Uh, but eventually a Roman general uh, would take over and stabilize the empire. And that was this uh, general named uh, Septimius Severus. He would he would seize power uh, eventually. And uh, Severus uh, was a um, Roman general under Commodus uh, who had found a new dynasty uh, after pretty much uh, the, pretty much the Antonines went out. Uh, and um, the Severans would rule from 193 to 235, so a period of like close to around four, four, four decades. And uh, what's interesting about uh, Severus was that he was actually from um, he was from Libya. He was from yeah, actually, I don't know if you're, anybody's Libyan out there, but <laughs> he, he's from Libya. Yeah, which is in North Africa, next to Egypt, and. Um, I think they say he was of some kind of origin that was like Semitic, uh, like maybe even Carthaginian or something like that. That's what they believe about him, or Berber. Maybe Berber might be actually what it is. 
And um, anyway, <clears throat> it's from a city called Leptis Magna, which uh, I think the ruins of it are on the northern coast of Libya. And uh, under him, um, the um, empire was very militaristic. Like I think it was one of the most militaristic periods in the Roman Empire. And even as you can see there, strengthened some of the fortifications, especially in the east. And he went back to Hadrian's Wall and strengthened it some more, which I think they talked about in the video about that. Um, oh, his wife, I don't think I got a picture of her, but his, his wife became famous. Uh, she was Empress uh, Julia Domna. Uh, she had a lot of power behind the throne. Uh, so they think she was maybe the one that had the real pants, you know, uh, in, in the actual rule. Uh, and uh, she was known for um, those two, of course, having uh, two sons, those were twins, by the way, twin sons, uh, which would actually rule, uh, which were Caracalla, Caracalla and Gaeta, uh, who at one point, by the way, for a few years, co-ruled together. Uh, but uh, I think after their father died, uh, they were kind of jealous of each other. Uh, Caracalla uh, didn't really like Gaeta and had him murdered uh, in 211. So it's kind of a kind of a vicious thing with that. Uh, and um, Caracalla's real name was not Caracalla. It was actually Antoninus uh, that he went by. Uh, and uh, he was called Caracalla because he would wear this cloak, this Roman cloak around him a lot all the time. It was called a Caracalla. So he got that nickname. But he was known for the so-called edict of Caracalla that came out 212. That's well known. And that that basically what it did was it gave full citizenship to all free men that lived throughout the empire, uh, which, you know, for, I guess for a long time, you couldn't get that, you know, unless you lived in Italy or something like that. Uh, and then um, he's also known for uh, building what they call the baths of Caracalla, which were built around the same time period, which were, I think, some of the last Roman baths that were actually constructed uh, that are kind of well known. So he he basically uh, was known for that uh, as well. Um, there were some other rulers. I don't think you got to know about the other ones. They're not as important. But um, Macrinus, uh, he was actually this Praetor Praetorian prefect, had a Praetorian guard, by the way, uh, that actually um, ended up killing, um, uh, believe it or not, uh, Caracalla and took over briefly for about a year or so. Uh, and then he was replaced by a cousin of Caracalla named Elegabalus, who was also called Antoninus as well. Uh, and then he also had Severus Alexander, another cousin. So uh, the last two rulers uh, were actually cousins uh, that actually reigned. And uh, the last one you can see there, I believe uh, Severus Alexander was the second longest reigning. Uh, what's interesting about the Severan dynasty of the seven of the seven rulers, six out of seven were all either murdered or assassinated. So a very bloodthirsty dynasty with a lot of them dying. So that's something you start to see with a lot of emperors. A lot of them get killed. Well, that's what happens to them. Uh, back up to here, by the way, I'll just briefly talk about this. But uh, there's a brief period where uh, the Severan dynasty collapses uh, in 235, and you get this period afterwards called the crisis of the third century. It's a period in the Roman Empire where there's like anarchy, where the empire almost declines and almost collapses uh, at that point. It lasts about 50 years, 235 to about 284, roughly. And uh, they have all kinds of names they call it. They call it the period of the military anarchy, uh, the period of the imperial crisis. Uh, but I think a lot of people call it the crisis of the third century. I don't know about the period part in there, but usually crisis of the third century, I think is how they actually say it. And uh, it was caused by all kinds of things. Uh, it's kind of a debate about what caused it. But anywhere from like civil war, you know, barbarian invasions start to happen, especially in the West. They start getting attacked by Germanic peoples and other peoples in, in parts of Europe and Asia. Plague outbreaks. They do think bubonic plague played kind of a role in causing the decline of the Roman Empire because it killed so many people. Uh, economic depression, uh, the, the currency, uh, which is denarii, I think they call it denarius, uh, a lot of the Roman coinage system was debased and wasn't worth as much. So yeah, a lot of inflation, things like that. Multiple emperors being killed, or you had all these pretenders uh, that wanted the throne. Uh, and uh, for a period, you actually had a deal where 
Uh, I think at one point there were 20, 30 emperors in power. Uh, that reigned in a 50-year period. I think it's actually 26, I think is what it is. Uh, and uh, they were called barracks emperors or soldier emperors because most of them came out of the army or they were backed by the army. And it was just a total mess uh, in the Roman Empire. Uh, it got so bad that the Roman Empire actually broke up, uh, believe it or not, into different competing parts. And you had three different uh, states at one point. You had the Gaelic Empire, which is in that green area you're looking at which included like Gaul, Germany, and part of Britain uh, that was in it. Uh, the Palmarine Empire, uh, by the way, was in the east. Can't see that one very well. That was in Syria, Turkey, uh, Israel, and Egypt. Uh, that was there. And so it broke away uh, right there. And then you see in the middle, that kind of reddish pink area, Roman Empire was kind of independent right there. So actually at one point, that's the way it looked like. Uh, for a while. It looked like the empire was just going to disintegrate or something like that. Uh, but in the 270s, there was an emperor named Aurelian uh, who came in. And Aurelian uh, was able to restore everything. He was able to re reunite the whole empire and, and kind of help to begin the end of the crisis period at that time. I think by 275, uh, he had basically done this. And so I think he was given the title later, which is Restorer of the World is what they called him. And uh, Aurelian was also very famous for building a, a series of fortifications in Rome uh, that were called the Aurelian Walls, uh, which you may have heard of. These are later walls, fortifications that were built in Rome uh, in the third century. And um, they basically helped to supersede the so-called Serbian war walls, which had been built back in the fourth century BC, like a long, long time ago. Uh, they were like much larger and um because you know rome had expanded from you know its earlier ancient times uh, and so these were built there and then of course rome was also being threatened a lot by different people uh, later on as you'll see and so that's why they built these walls uh, more or less so you so know that's like the the period of the so-called principate pretty much they called it which is the you know the period from augustus up to uh the crisis period that's what they usually call it the principate now, they're going to move on to talk about next, another period, of course, in the Roman Empire, uh, which it's called different names, but it's usually called the uh, so-called principate. Uh, is what the, yeah, excuse me, the dominate. It's what they call it. Yeah, the dominate. It's what they usually dub it. Uh, and um, you have a new Roman emperor that comes in, uh, which is Emperor Diocletian, uh, who you see here, uh, right here. Yeah, Diocletian, who reigns, by the way, from 284 uh, to 305. Uh, Diocletian's real important. He's the emperor that helps to stabilize or restabilize uh, the empire, uh, especially after what Aurelian had already done at that point uh, as emperor. And he pretty much is the emperor that kind of finally ends the, the, the crisis period we're talking about, the third century. Now, I'll get to it later. He does it with a lot of reforms, uh, especially at this thing called the Tetrarchy. Uh, that you have. And um, I was talking about how um, in this period they have a, they call it the um, dominate uh, because one of the first things that um, that Diocletian does that's well known, he adopts a new title, uh, which is uh, Dominus, uh, which means, by the way, in Latin, it means either Lord or Master. That becomes the main title of the Roman emperors up to like the 5th century CE, from 284 to 476. And so oftentimes they call that part of the Roman Empire, they call it the Dominate, uh, you know. And um, so he's trying to kind of strengthen the emperor, uh, it's, it's his power in general. And pretty much it does that in the East, uh, although in the Western Empire, the emperors are more weaker because the Roman armies control a lot of power. Um now, the thing that he's mostly known for, uh, Diocletian, is the so-called tetrarchy uh, that he helps to establish, which you may have heard about this system, uh, which is well known. Uh, and uh, the tetrarchy um, is a type of new kind of governmental system that the Romans devised under Diocletian. It really starts in 293, although he started back in the 280s, they believe. And what he did was he divided the Roman Empire into having two main emperors or two senior emperors 
uh, which were called an Augusti, uh, which the singular term was Augustus, you know, like the original emperor that started the whole Roman Empire a long time ago. And uh, what it did was it divided the empire into two halves, which will be a Western Roman Empire and an Eastern Roman Empire, which will later be called the Byzantine Empire. And if you look at this map here, of course, of the Roman Empire, just kind of like it's by the fourth century you're looking at right there. Uh, the Roman Empire, you can see, will be divided in these two halves. So Western Roman Empire, where Rome's the capital. Later, of course, the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine, it's called also, is later got a capital, which is the Constantinople, uh, now called Istanbul. So it starts dividing eventually like that, east and west. So you have this deal where both sides had, you know, and they had a you know Western Augustus over here that you've got, and then you got an Eastern Augustus over there. Uh, also, which is true, he also added these um, what they call these co-emperor successors, uh, which were called uh, Caesars or Caesar. Uh, you're talking about one of them, I guess. So a Western Caesar and an Eastern Caesar, and so you end up this with this deal where um, you got basically you know, an emperor in the West and an emperor in the East. And then you got these junior emperors uh, that are basically underneath that you've got. So you can see from here, what happened was Diocletian set himself up uh, as the emperor in the East, like the Augustus of the East right here. Uh, Maximianus, who's a Roman general, was set up in the West, you see. Uh, and then you have these successors underneath them, Constantius I, you see on the bottom, uh, the Caesar in the West and Galerius, the Caesar in the East, uh, that you have. So that was the initial setup of uh, the Tetrarchy, of course, uh, in, in 293. Uh, by the way, Tetrarchy means in Greek, ruled by four, or, or four, having four rulers, or governed by four rulers. And uh, the actual rulers are called Tetrarchs, like all four of them uh, combined. And um, you can see that, Part of why he, he developed the Tetrarchy was for two reasons. One is it allowed a line of secession, you can see. So when the Western Augustus would die, the Western Caesar would take over. And so the Eastern Augustus, the Caesar on the bottom, Eastern one would take over when he died or stepped down. Also, it made it more effective in ruling the whole empire because Instead of one emperor having to micromanage the whole empire, which was, you know, vast and large, you now had four distinct regions where each ruler would control. So it made things a lot easier to rule, of course. Uh, now, also going back to Diocletian, uh, there was one thing about him that was kind of controversial. I will mention uh, about him which you may have heard about. Uh, Diocletian, by the way, was one of the last major emperors to persecute Christians. Uh, they went after him pretty good. And it was like happened over a period of like 10 years. It, start, it was started, and it was called the Diocletianic Persecution. And the Catholic Church called it later the Great Persecution. Not sure how great it was, but uh, they think it was exaggerated. But uh, what happened was the Tetrarchs were hoping to save the traditional Roman religions, uh, the pagan, paganism is called later by Christians. And um, basically, Christianity was becoming the majority religion throughout the Roman Empire. Uh, and so uh, they wanted to try to save, you know, the traditional religions and the use of the temples. And so they basically banned people from practicing or trying to anyway. And I know they, they banned people from like if you were in the Roman government or in the Roman military, you could not be Christian. Uh, so was, you find out uh, you were kicked out or arrested. Uh, they also seized your property and things like that. And so uh, there were many Christians that were in prison uh, or uh, even put to death. Uh, how many were actually killed? Uh, that's debated. Uh, I believe it's only a few thousand, I believe, like three to 4,000, I think, is how many uh, may have been killed, actually, during that time period. I don't think it was that many, they think, but the Catholic Church later kind of exaggerated and all that about what it was. Uh, I'll talk about a couple more things he did. You don't have to really know about it, but uh, he was also very famous for, he was one of the first emperors that started hiring a lot of mercenaries, which he called federati, which is a, a Latin word meaning ally. That's what it means, uh, which they started to put a lot of these in the Roman armies. And you see that in the West a lot. 
which will, that's kind of what the cause of the Western Empire's demise later is the Germans taking over. You also try to do this price freeze thing, if you know about that, called the Edict of Maximum Prices. It didn't go, go well with people because it was like a lot of inflation. And a lot of people blamed it for making it worse, like the economy. So not exactly didn't work well. So, but but they think the political thing kind of worked, but not the economic things that he did, all that. Now, the Tetrarchy eventually would fail. Uh, there was a Roman emperor I'll talk about later named Constantine uh, that'll come along. And uh, Constantine the Great is one of the main uh, generals and also an emperor later that, that gets involved in what they call the uh, Civil War of the Tetrarchies, break out, uh, which they think starts in about 306 and goes up to really the 320s. It's, it's around a long time. Uh, that you have these wars that, that break out. And uh, it was actually caused by the fact that um, Diocletian had become ill. And uh, what happened was he decided to step down. So Diocletian abdicated in the year 305, and he forced the, the Augustus in the West to, to actually abdicate too. It's Maximianus. He had to step down. And so these emperors blow. Constantius became the main emperor in the West. Galerius became the emperor in the, West, in, the, in the East. And so they thought everybody was happy. Well, they weren't. <laughs> uh, and so uh, what ends up happening, apparently, right after this occurs, Constantius I drops dead. Uh, natural cause, I think, at 306. And so they start vying for power, of course, uh, in the West uh, that you're looking at. And um, you actually have three men uh, at one point that fight it out. Uh, for control. I'll kind of go through them real quicker, but of course, Constantine the first, who you see on the left there, was the son of Constantius. So he basically uh, thought he should get the throne. That, that's his father. Uh, Maximianus, who had, had retired, he wanted to, to get back in power, get his throne back. And then Maxentius was his son, the son of Maxi Maximianus. So you got three men trying to fight it out, uh, basically. And uh, what happens in the West is by 312, uh, Constantine would defeat all the different other rulers, uh, or I guess the competitors that were trying to take control uh, in the West. And he would declare himself emperor, uh, Augustus in the West. Uh, over time, he's going to take over the East as well and combine the two states uh, into one empire. But the one thing that's very famous, you know, about Constantine, uh, that of course everybody's heard about, about him, uh, as you know, he was the first Roman emperor, uh, of course, to to seize power, uh, and basically one of the first ones to be you know patronage of the, the Roman of the Christian people, I guess, uh, more or less supporter of them. Uh, later, of course, one of the first emperors to become a saint, you know, in the Orthodox and Catholic churches. Uh, later, uh, that's his uh, image, of course, you see on the right. Uh, with this coin. Uh, you also see the Chi Rho. I don't know if you notice that or not. The Chi Rho, uh, the top right right here. The Chi Rho, of course, became one of the first symbols, you know, of the of Christianity uh, that they use, uh, which Chi Rho is just the first two Greek letters of the uh, Greek word Christos, which means Christ, of course, uh, in Greek. Uh, and um, anyway, they use that a lot as an early symbol, you know, with Christianity, Oh, and all that. Uh, there's a famous legend that uh, he supposedly um, converted at a battle called the Battle of Milvian Bridge in 312 CE, uh, but they don't think it's true. Uh, they think it was later, like on his deathbed, uh, when he actually converted. So, But he became a big, big su supporter of, the, of Christians. And what happened was in 313, he issued this thing called the Edict of Milan, uh, which basically pretty much ended the whole persecution of Christians uh, throughout the empire, which was already starting to happen in, in, in the East. Like in the East, they had this edict called the Edict of Toleration passed by Emperor Galerius. And um, both those particular edicts helped to recognize Christianity as a legal religion. Uh, the Romans would, you know, treat the, the Christians benevolent, you know, not harm them and things like that. And they would, you know, gave their property back and rights back and, and things like that. And so that's going to be a major turning point, you know, with Christianity uh, in history, because 
within the next, I guess, 70, 80 years, you're going to see the Roman Empire start to convert more uh, to being a Christian state, uh, which it will. The Byzantine Empire is going to be pretty much a Christian state, the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, later. Um, what's going to happen, of course, next? The other thing that he also did that's well known uh, is he um, was very famous for starting the so-called First Council of Nicaea, uh, which met in 325 CE uh, in what is um, Turkey. Uh, it's something he did. And um, 325, yeah, you're looking at it right there. And the um, Council of Nicaea was an ecumenical council of, of Christian clergymen, like bishops and so on. Uh, that met there, and they met there to, uh, you know, in uh, northern Turkey on the Black Sea to meet out, you know, what the main foundations of this Christian church uh, would be, which is, you know, the church that would be part eventually of the Roman Empire uh, later. It's the basis, you know, of the, of the you know, uh, Orthodox in, in the Catholic churches that you'll have, you know, in the future, and um, there's like all kinds of things it did, uh, which is famous, I got a list of they. They talked about what the nature of God. Well, what is God? What is God going to be uh, for this Christian church? Uh, so obviously, we pick Jesus. Jesus Christ, you know, would be eventually the main church uh, they would develop. Uh, they also had this other problem. They had the Arian controversy was a big thing. Uh, Arianism. I know you've heard about that, but Arianism was this type of religion. It was called Arian Christianity, uh, which was popularized by Arius. He was a Christian priest from North North Africa, and uh, he was going around preaching the fact that um, God was actually two co-eternal gods, uh, which were Father and Son. Father begat the Son. They weren't equal. He even said the Father was greater than the Son, and that didn't sit well with some Christians because they thought that diminished you know, Jesus, who Jesus was, uh, and all that. Uh, and so um, basically... What happened was they forced Christians in the in the church, if you know about this early on, to adopt what they call the Nicene Creed, uh, which was a type of statement of belief saying you believe in the Trinity uh, and all that. And so they they basically, you know, the Trinity, the Trinity or Trinitarianism became basically, you know, the main belief of what God was uh, in the Christian church, that God was three things but one, right? Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Uh, and so that became the basis of, you know, what I guess God was, the nature of God anyway, uh, more or less. Weird thing about Arianism, it was still practiced up to um, medieval modern times. It's still around today. And I think the Jehovah's Witnesses are, I think, kind of like modern Arians that are still kind of practicing something similar to that, uh, believe it or not. Oh, I had that thing in there, too, about that, which was true about that. They did set, like, the dates of Easter, which ended up in the spring, if you know about that, like it is now. You know, like after Mardi Gras and all that today, like in Louisiana. Uh, he, they also set the Sabbath to Sunday uh, as well, which used to be on a Saturday, you know, about that. Because that's when the Jews and the pagans all had their you know, holy day and all that. And then also a lot of the church canon laws, uh, the New Testament books were decided on. Uh, they decided what the four Gospels were going to be uh, that I talked about before. Uh, they kind of voted on it. And I think it was a tie. It was a tie. They couldn't decide on some of the books uh, that would go on it. But they do think that Constantine the Great was the one that commissioned the first New Testaments uh, to be published right afterwards, all written in Greek, uh, close to about 330 or 331 CE. Uh, and then St. Jerome later translated into Latin, if you know about that, uh, which became the big, big, uh, you know, New Testament for the Catholic Church. Uh, the other thing that happened, too, that's well known with uh, Constantine the Great, he also founded Constantinople uh, around the year 330. That's something he's known for. And that became the new capital of the Roman Empire, especially later the Eastern Roman Empire. And it was, of course, built, uh, in western Turkey uh, on the Black Sea. It's actually near this, what they call the Sea of Marmara. Uh, it's kind of south of the Black Sea. And it was built on a heavily fortified peninsula uh, that's kind of right across from the Asian side. It's actually on the European side, but it's now part of the western, Repo western part of the Republic of Turkey today. And uh, they were actually going to call it New Rome or Nova Roma. That's what 
I think Constantine wanted to call it, like New Rome. Uh, but the people didn't want to call it that. They wanted to name it after Constantine. So Constantinople meant Constantine's city, basically. And then today it's called Istanbul, uh, which is more of the Turkish name that they call it now. Uh, oh, they call it later, uh, the, uh, it's, as you know, it's the capital of the uh, uh, Byzantine Empire. That's what, that's what it's famous for, uh, if you know about that, which is called Eastern Roman Empire. And they call it Byzantine because of the fact that it was built on top of this ancient Greek city uh, that was built back in Greek times, called Byzantium or Byzantium, either one. And so uh, the name Byzantine or Byzantine was the name that they, they called it later. Uh, but um, they didn't really call themselves Byzantines. I think some people sometimes use that term when they describe some of the Romans in the East. Uh, that's more of a modern name. They started calling them later. Uh, I think they mostly call themselves Romans still uh, later, but I'll get more into the Eastern Roman Empire or Byzantine Empire. I'll talk more into that in the when I get to the Middle Ages because that's kind of the beginning of that period. But the Western Empire will fall in the West. The Eastern Empire is, going, of course, going to continue of course, further. Uh, of course, you can see the Hagia Sophia in the background, which is a famous uh, the, uh, church that was built by, of course, the Byzantine Empire under Emperor Justinian. You can see there, yeah, it was built most of it. The eastern part, it was built mostly on a peninsula. You can see uh, overlooking the water there. You can see the Hippodrome, their famous um, version of the Circus Maximus, where they had like chariot races and things like that uh, right there. Uh, let me move on and also talk about some other emperors that were well known. Uh, now, uh, they have later this other emperor uh, that they have. That's Constantine right there. They got Theodosius the Great. Uh, he, of course, was another emperor that's well known. Uh, who Really, I think they consider him to be one of the last great emperors of really the end of the later Roman Empire. Um, they have other emperors too, but... Uh, I think Theodosius is considered one of the last ones before you have the Byzantine Empire, like Justinian, you know, in the east. And um, one thing about him, uh, he's the last sole ruler of the Roman Empire, where he rules over the eastern and western halves of it, uh, which he did for about three or four years. And uh, the reason why Theodosius is important is because he's the actual emperor that would force the Romans uh, to convert uh, to Christianity. Uh, that's that's the big thing he does, uh, which you can see here. And so he basically forces everybody to adopt Nicene Christianity. He even tries to even stamp out Arian Christianity as well. Uh, he then even goes further in the 390s when he's sole ruler, and he starts forcing everybody to uh, be Christian or be killed, I think more or less. And so uh, the, he actually banned paganism uh, at one point uh, within within his empire, that even led to uh, the fact that um, basically uh, it later led to the banning of the the Olympics. Olympics got got banned, and so you can see here. Here's the size of the Roman. It's still a pretty large empire at that time. Uh, you can see, but what happens afterwards? Uh, he dies in 395, and the empire is split in two permanently. Uh, he's got one son. Uh, Honorius, uh, who takes over the Western Roman Empire. And then uh, Arcadius took over the Eastern Roman Empire. And so the two never got back together uh, after that. And so uh, the Western Roman Empire will, will eventually decline, collapse, of course. And the Eastern Roman Empire will kind of continue on as the Byzantine Empire, which shrinks over time. You know, it's not really nothing compared to uh, the original Roman Empire, uh, but it will continue up to almost uh, the Middle Ages, uh, which I'll get to later. So um, let me go ahead and talk for a few minutes about the end, end of the Roman Empire. Of course, the thing that happens in the end, uh, as you know, is the Roman Empire eventually, you know, falls in the West. That's one of the things that really caused the whole, you know, collapse of the Roman Empire is the West, the West gets taken over, which some of it was due to internal conflicts that politically, economically, in general, uh, that they had. Uh, but they believe the main reason why the Roman Empire collapsed, especially in the West, was because of the barbarian invasions uh, that occurred, which really go back for this, 
back at the time of Marcus Aurelius, but uh, they start really in the fourth, fifth century, uh, really taking off. And uh, they call this period, you can see a map here showing all the different migrations and invasions that happened uh, within the empire of the Romans. Uh, basically, it was often called the migration period that they dub it. So you get this migration of different barbarian peoples. That's what they called them anyway uh, back then. And uh, so you get these Germanic peoples that come in, also non German, like Asiatic peoples that come from the east, that come in, uh, that take over the empire and slowly, you know, invade. And you can see kind of a map, like the east gets attacked too, but predominantly it's in the west uh, that most of the empire uh, gets overrun uh, over time. Uh, in Germany, they called it the, the Volker Wandering. Uh, that's what they called it, which means the wandering of the people. And you got this deal where the Germanic peoples start leaving Germany, and pushing into the rest of Europe. So this creates a lot of chaos in the West. And part of it was because they wanted to, you know, um, move into the more prosperous Roman Empire, but also because they were escaping other people invading, like the Huns. They were taking over parts of, parts of Europe uh, at the time. I uh, can kind of see a list of them right there, but I'll kind of put them on the screen for you. But these are, are some of the different types of Germanic peoples that eventually come in uh, that take over uh, most of the empire in the West, uh, the Goths, which the Goths were broken into two major groups called the Visigoths and the Ostrogoths, the Vandals, uh, the Franks, uh, the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, which usually kind of comprises the so-called Anglo-Saxon peoples from Northern Europe, Burgundians from Germany, uh, the Lombards also as well. So those are all kinds of different groups that kind of come in uh, and eventually take over. Also a lot of non-Germans, people forget about this, but not just the Huns and Slavs, but Avars, the Bulgars, uh, the Magyars, uh, Magyars like Hungarian peoples later. Uh, you know, those are all kinds of peoples that come in later that eventually take over, especially Eastern Central Europe. Uh, in the future. Uh, let me first talk about the Visigoths. They say the Visigoths was one of the first major peoples that really invade uh, the Roman Empire. They were actually invited <laughs> into the Roman Empire uh, to come in because the, the Romans wanted soldiers for their armies, so-called federati, I told you about. Uh, and so, um, so they came in, they were treated real bad. Uh, they were given citizenship, but a lot of people didn't see them as equal to other Romans. And so they formed their own armies, and they attacked the east. And they had this king named King Alaric. He actually marched his forces westward through the Roman Empire, sacked Rome in the year 410, 410 CE. Uh, you can kind of see him marching across the empire uh, right here uh, in kind of that uh, purple area right here, going through Greece, laying it to waste through Italy and then marching uh, into uh, what is basically uh, Spain here, which they eventually they would take over Spain, uh, the, the Visigoths, and they would form their own state, uh, which was called the Visigothic Kingdom. Uh, they also had cousins, which were the Ostrogoths, which came a little later. They took over uh, what is uh, Italy as well and formed their own state called the Ostrogothic Kingdom, which ruled Italy it was Dalmatia, which is later called Yugoslavia in modern times up to the 20th century anyway. So, um, so yeah, those two groups basically were there. Uh, things were so bad in the West that they had to move the capital. I don't know if you know about this, but around, I think, the early 400s, they moved the capital of Rome to Ravenna, which is right here in the upper Adriatic. So in the mid to late 5th century, that's where the capital of Rome was. It was Ravenna, R-A-V-E-N-N-A, -N -N -A, right there. Which I'll mention later about Ravenna a little bit. Um, then you had another group called the Vandals that came in next. The Vandals would march across also the Western Empire as well. They sacked Rome too. Yeah, 455 CE as well. Under this king named King Gazeric. Uh, and uh, they took over what is um, basically uh, North Africa, where Carthage is, and they had this kingdom that was called um, it was called the Kingdom of the Vandals, or also called the Vandelic Kingdom, I think is the common name. They actually called it. 
So you can see there a map right there. You can see how the vandals take over. That's in the blue areas you're looking at. They were from Germany, so they marched here across here and then took over North Africa. They also took over a lot of the islands uh, in, in the Mediterranean Sea, Sicily, Sardinia, Corsica, uh, et cetera. Uh, then there was another one that was called the Franks. I want to mention about the Franks. The Franks basically were in Germany. Uh, they invaded crossing the Rhine River. And they took over Gaul, which they called later France or Francia. And so they would actually form their own state out of that, which was called the Kingdom of the Franks, or called Francia for short, usually. Uh, and uh, they, they're they kind of important later in starting the um, Middle Ages, like early Middle Ages in, in Western Europe, which we'll talk about later. You've heard of Charlemagne, probably. He's kind of related to them, all that. Uh, then the Angles, the Saxons, the Jews, the Anglo-Saxons up in Northern Europe uh, also invaded, uh, crossing the North Sea. Uh, using ships. Uh, they attacked Rome and Britain. Uh, and so they'll later form their own states also uh, in England, uh, which were called the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, like you see there, East Anglo Anglia, Mercia, Northumbria, Wessex, of course, one of the most famous because uh, of Alfred the Great in the Middle Ages. Uh, so, um, yeah, so they're, they, they're basically, the Romans are forced to basically abandon uh, most of that territory right there. Uh, then, of course, you had this other guy that came in into play here, you know, which was Attila the Hun. Uh, and, of course, the Huns uh, that come in, which I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, today uh, as well. Uh, the Huns uh, would also invade, too, you know, into uh, the Roman Empire. Uh, they, of course, would form their own empire. Uh, the Huns were a nomadic people. Uh, they fought on horseback. You can see they're kind of like the Mongols later maybe even descended from the Mongols, uh, and uh, they think they came out of the uh, steppe areas of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, it should be Asia, by the way, not Europe. Oops. But uh, anyway, um, they were notorious for fighting on horseback, uh, and they took over Eastern Europe, though, of course. But um, they think they came out of, like, close to where China was or Mongolia. And um, I think there's some theories that, they may have been related to a type of uh, people that were called the Shang Nu, uh, who, of course, attacked China a long time ago. The Mongols may have been descended from them, too, as well. Uh, but we, what we know about uh, the Hanuk Empire was it was a large-sized empire that, that basically spread over Eastern Europe uh, and also part of Central Europe. It went into Asia, or at least part of Western Asia, and uh, you can see how large it was. It stretched from what it's like basically close to where Germany is all the way to the Caspian Sea. Uh, so it's it's an empire which is almost as large as the Roman Empire uh, at one point. But most of the um, actual um, most of the actual Huns were based predominantly close to where Hungary is today. You know where Budapest is and all that today. So I think that's where his capital was right there. And so from there, he would use that to attack uh, till the Hun, you know, would, would use that to attack basically uh, parts of the, the two parts of the Roman Empire uh, at the time. Uh, Attila was called the scourge of God. Uh, Attila, you know, uh, was their greatest ruler. Uh, he reigned in power uh, for close to 15, 20 years. He was called that because a lot of the Christians thought he was sent by God. Uh, to basically attack them and kill Christians. And uh, during his reign, he was heavily feared by both empires. Uh, if you know about this in the 440s, uh, he actually attacked the Eastern Roman Empire first. Uh, it was so bad that the Eastern Roman Empire had to build separate fortifications on the western side of Constantinople uh, to defend it, uh, to kind of basically stop him. Uh, which he wasn't as successful attacking in the east, uh, but uh, he was more successful in the west in the 450s. Uh, 450s CE, uh, Tilla would come back uh, and he would attack Gaul, uh, if you know about this. And uh, 451 CE in the summer, uh, he actually invaded, uh, attempting to conquer it. Uh, and so the Romans got really desperate. Uh, they realized that if Gaul fell, uh, the, the, maybe most of the Western Empire would fall too. 
uh, to the Hunnic Empire. And so the Romans brought up this um, Roman barbarian army, which was a mix of Roman and Germanic forces that were federati. And at the Battle of Chalons, which is called all kinds of names, Battle of Catalonian Fields or Catalonian Plains, uh, the Romans were able to defeat uh, Tilla and repulse him, uh, luckily. And um, so, so yeah, Attila, Attila would actually try to march on. He would actually try to uh, invade Italy. He, yeah, in four, I think 452, he tried to invade Italy uh, as well. And um, But his forces were supposedly repulsed due to some kind of um, plague that was ravishing his forces. And so he basically marched back to Hungary, uh, where he died in 453 of a strange um, death, which is kind of weird. I don't know if you have a story about Attila the Hun, but he supposedly got married uh, in, uh, to some young bride, and on the, his wedding night, he drank too much, and he, um, I think he um, supposedly uh, got, uh, I think he had a bad nosebleed or something like that, and it killed him. <laughs> just kind of weird. I guess he died of a nosebleed, which is kind of weird. But anyway, um, so, yeah, that's basically, you know, the Western Empire is starting to look bad uh, at that point, like it's going to collapse any time. Uh, they had one more emperor they always talk about in the West uh, that kind of is like one of the last ones that really steps down, which is Rhymus Augustulus, or Augustus, they call him also as well. And um, pretty much by the 470s, the Germanic peoples starting to take over the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, pretty much the emperors in the West were figureheads. They weren't as powerful as the emperor in the East. And, the, you know, the generals of the armies, uh, who I think were called a patrician, uh, were in total control uh, of, of basically the armies. And they had this German general named Odo Acer basically decided that he had had enough of these, you know, emperors on the throne. And so he forced the one of the last ones, Romulus Augustus or Augustulus, he's called either one, uh, to abdicate. Uh, Augustus, Augustus supposedly means little August is what the name means. Uh, they call him also Romulus Augustus. Uh, but he was actually this 14-year-old boy uh, that they forced out of power, who had been only in power since, I think, 475. And so this occurred at Ravenna, I told you, which is, you know, I told you the capital of the Western Empire at the time uh, in the 5th century. And uh, so... At that point, there's no more emperors in the West. So nobody, like the Germans anyway, that like there's states that are forming in the West, they don't recognize, you know, any emperors uh, after that. Uh, even though I think there's an emperor in the East named, um, I think his name was Zeno, I think is the emperor at the time. He, he sees himself as the emperor in the West, you know, as like a sole emperor, uh, basically. But pretty much in the West, there's no emperor afterwards uh, overall. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that people don't think that they're still Romans. You know, even up to, I think, I want to say going from the 5th into the 6th century, you know, people still think that they're Romans and all that. Uh, but you start to see the beginning of the medieval period, you know, coming in uh, after that. Uh, 476, usually called that yeah, or AD or whatever, uh, it's usually designated as the year when the Western Empire kind of collapses, basically, and doesn't exist. Uh, that was something that was invented by this Roman historian or, I guess, popularized, uh, which is Edward Gibbon, who you may have heard of. Uh, Edward Gibbon is a British writer, historian uh, that uh, was very famous for his book, you may have heard of, called The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, which was published in multiple volumes uh, in the late 18th century. So very famous, probably one of the greatest books ever written, you know, in modern times anyway, on the Roman Empire. He kind of goes into like why the Roman Empire, you know, fell and all that. And um, so, yeah, the, the decline and collapse of the Roman Empire, that's the thing about it is it's going to eventually lead into uh, the Middle Ages, like the beginning stages of it. And uh, some historians even think that the Middle Ages started way back, you know, going back to maybe even the third century when they had the crisis period uh, and all that. 